Yeah, today I'm going to tell you some things from the 90s and the 2000s. Uh, so this is the title of the lecture, Beyond Worst Case Analysis. Uh, and what do I mean by that? So this is something we focused on throughout the class in our definitions, you know, worst case analysis, worst case running time, worst case input, et cetera, et cetera. So let's explore that uh, issue a little bit. So let us assume, as I usually do, that P does not equal NP. OK, we'll assume this for the rest of the lecture. OK, so, um, yeah, so therefore, 3 sad is not in P. OK. Well, what does that mean? Uh, it means, um, well, it means there does not exist a poly time algorithm uh, with the following property. For all, you know, three CNF formulas, phi, um, you know, A of phi accepts if and only if phi is satisfiable. Well, that's exactly what it means. There's just no polynomial time algorithm that gets the correct answer of satisfiability for every input phi. And uh, this is the way I usually think about it, but another way you can equivalently think about it um, is to say that uh, there does not exist a polynomial time algorithm A with the following property. Um, instead of worrying about for all 3CNF, you know, that it gets the correct answer if it's satisfiable or not, you can just worry about what it does when the the input is satisfiable, but you have a stronger uh, requirement. So that for all phi that are in the language 3 set, in other words, that actually are satisfiable, uh, A of phi outputs a satisfying assignment. Why are these two things equivalent, by the way? Mm, if I have an algorithm, suppose for a contradiction that I have an algorithm with this guarantee, how do I get an algorithm that has this the property? Yeah? It gives you satisfying assignment and Yeah. Uh, that's right. You just run, you just try to run this algorithm, and if it finds a satisfying assignment, you can check that it's really a satisfying assignment and then say it's satisfiable. In this, uh, this uh, algorithm, there's no assumption at all about what the heck A does if you give it an unsatisfying assignment, unsatisfiable assignment, sorry, if you give it an unsatisfiable formula. But it doesn't matter. Like, whatever it does, it's not going to output a satisfying assignment because the formula is unsatisfiable. And conversely, suppose I give you an algorithm that can just tell yes or no whether a, a formula is satisfiable. How do you get an algorithm that, given a satisfiable formula, outputs a satisfying assignment? Yeah? Yeah, that's right. We actually talked about this in many lectures ago. It's this search to decision uh, reduction, where if you, just, if you can tell yes or no, then you could try setting the first variable to be true or false, see if the thing is satisfiable. That tells you a good way to set it. Go on to the second variable, etc. OK, so since we're assuming p does not equal np in this, this uh, lecture, that means these algorithms do not exist. And therefore, we are sad. So what should we do? Uh, and that's where I come to this. Well, I mean, uh, you know, if we're sad, we can try to make ourselves happy. Uh, and there's various ways you could try to just you know, relax your goals. OK, so all right, there's not exist polynomial time algorithm A that for every input always gets the right answer, you know, for all of those, you know, possibilities, you can relax your, you can relax your ambitions. So one thing you can do is, you know, try to solve 3 sad exactly on all instances, but allow more than polynomial time. You know, that's one possibility. So for example, as we've seen, or I've mentioned a few times, you actually can do 3 sad in like better than 2 to the n time. You can do it in time, I don't know, 1.34 to the n or something. So maybe you could, you know, push on that front. If maybe if you can solve sad in 
time n to the log log n, you might be very happy, pretty happy. I mean, given that it's the best you can do. Uh, OK, another thing you can do is kind of relax your notion of correctness. You still want to, in this case, maybe run in polynomial time, and you still want to do something good for every possible input 3CNF. But maybe, you know, approximating, uh, sorry, maybe doing something good will only be kind of approximately good. Um, so actually, this can lead to a notion that's very popular in algorithms research called approximation algorithms. And, um, Focus on the right half of the board here. So like what we know doesn't exist is, you know, an algorithm where you, if you give it a satisfiable formula, it comes back with a perfectly satisfying assignment. But maybe you'd be kind of happy with the following. Like maybe there exists, you know, poly time algorithm A uh, such that, you know, for all input formulas that are actually satisfiable, Maybe it doesn't output uh, a perfectly satisfying assignment, but maybe A phi outputs an assignment satisfying at least, I don't know, 90% of the clauses. And um, that might make you happy. I mean, it could be good. I mean, it depends on maybe your motivation for like why you're interested in whether or not phi is satisfiable. Sometimes they use it, for example, like to test like the correctness of circuits or programs. And if you know the the thing has like no bugs, if the uh, if there's a satisfying assignment, and so if you find like a 90% satisfying assignment, you know if you have something like 90% of the lines work correctly in your program, then that means nothing for the overall program. So maybe that's not so good. But, you know, if, I don't know, it, the assignment represents like a bunch of, you know, you're scheduling something and somehow the formula represents a bunch of constraints that you want to be made true, you might be happy if you get like 90% of them true. Okay, so those are, those are possibilities. Or the third thing you might do is, you know, keep polynomial time and keep correctness, but relax your like goal to have uh, you know, uh, an answer on all inputs, or a correct answer on all inputs. Okay, so maybe um, you could try to find, you know, poly time, uh, three sat algorithms that are correct on, you know, most inputs. And here you have to kind of figure out what you mean by most, and we'll talk about that in this lecture. So for example, maybe most might just mean the simplest possible thing, like at least 99% of all 3CNF. Again, this may or may not be, you know, make you happy. I mean, uh, well, yeah, it's pretty good. On the other hand, if your 3CNF happens to be one that's not in the 99%, then it could be set. OK, so um, these are all like, good ideas. These are all ideas that you know, algorithms people work on to you know, try to you know, get over this sad fact that p does not equal np. Uh, but you know, this is a complexity class. To heck with the algorithms. We want to show negative results. That's what we're all about in 455. Um, so I want to tell you about um, yeah, like trying to argue or give evidence that like, even these relaxed problems are hard. So you cannot uh, necessarily shoot for too much. OK. Um, so if this is our, you know, our glorious negative dream to show that even these like, uh, easier versions of problems cannot be done, uh, let me tell you what the, the ultimate goal would be. The dream scenario would be um, show some kind of, well, in fact, show hardness for either any of these. You know, one or two or three. Um, just assuming p does not equal np. Okay, so in this lecture and kind of generally in life, people are generally willing to assume that p does not equal np. Um, so you know, it tells you you cannot have like the perfect sad algorithm that's polynomial time, and it's always correct on all instances. But it'd be cool if you could show you know 
it actually further implies a stronger statement that, you know, maybe this is, uh, you know, solving SAD in like a little bit super polynomial time is impossible. Or solving SAD on 99% of instances is impossible. I mean, that would be great. I mean, then we just say that if P does not equal MP, we get like even stronger consequences than it naively appears. Um, but often this is uh, hard, challenging. So let me tell you the backup dream. The backup dream is to like make, let's say like one new basic assumption and try to derive many consequences from it. Consequences of the form, you know, variations of one, two, and three are impossible. Okay, so, um, of course, you know, if you're willing to, like, make lots of assumptions, <laughs> then you're done. You can just say, well, I'm going to assume that you cannot solve three set faster than this. Done. Or you can assume that there's no polynomial time algorithm that cannot solve three set correctly on 99% of all three CNFs. Done. But, you know, you can't just assume everything that you want to, to be true and, and not do anything. So like what would be nice if maybe you could like make one assumption, maybe stronger than P does not equal NP, and then derive from it like many, many consequences. Okay, like a minimal assumption. And in fact, that's what the whole business is here. I mean, this is, just this is already like an instance of like the, the backup dream, right? Like in the 1970s, they had problems like three sat and three coloring and clique and everything, and they wanted to show there are no polynomial time algorithms for them. And they couldn't, but then they, they, they executed the backup dream. They're like, okay, we're going to make this one assumption called P does not equal NP, or equivalently that 3SAT has no polynomial time algorithm. And then they derive thousands of consequences. These are all like, you know, the NP completeness reductions. Like as soon as you assume 3SAT is, you know, hard for polynomial time algorithms, you get it for like all sorts of other problems. So that was like, you know, a good execution of this, this backup dream. And uh, I want to tell you a little bit about such possibilities now. And, I mean, I like to tell people about this, uh, you know, complexity class, because sometimes you get the impression that, like, you know, there's just P versus NP, and then NP completeness, and that's all there is. But we're still stuck in life on proving uh, to be hard some things that we think are hard, and we don't know how to prove it, even if we assume P does not equal NP. And it seems sometimes you can get unstuck if you have a stronger assumption. And um, I want to tell you some stronger assumptions that are, like, have been made and are considered... Um, you know, plausible. It's not like just some random made-up thing. Like, it's the hardest assumption people have thought about. Okay, so let's uh, let's talk about some of these categories. So, um, in fact, let's talk about one beyond polynomial time. So here we don't know how to do the dream. I mean, if I tell you that stack cannot be solved in polynomial time. And now say, try to show that SAT can't be solved in quasi-polynomial time. We don't know how to do that. Uh, but in fact, we've already talked about uh, assumptions, you know, the backup dream here in, in this case. We talked several times in this class about the exponential time hypothesis. And there's also even a strong exponential time hypothesis, which to, you know, briefly remind you, it's, uh, it's that there exists a positive number delta zero such that 3 SAT cannot be solved in time to, to the delta zero n. Okay, so it says that, in fact, 3 side not only is in polynomial time, like it requires at least time 1.000001 to the n for some number of zeros. And, uh, okay, that's good. I mean, that's sort of just uh, assumed, it looks like you sort of assumed away the whole ball game, but um, actually what's very cool about this, and this is what I'm gonna talk to you about in the next lecture on Tuesday, is that you get like many cool consequences of this. So, and this is a really active field of research like right now um, to show things, one thing is you can show things like this, like if the exponential time hypothesis is true, then um, there's no algorithm that solves that longest common sequence, subsequence problem faster than n squared. And that's kind of cool because it's like a hardness result for a problem that's in P. 
Okay, so we'll see things like that next time. And actually, we already saw one thing like this. If you assume some kind of circuit-based variant of ETH, which I just wrote twiddle ETH, then we saw, this was in lecture uh, 22, uh, Professor Guruswamy mentioned this. This implies that BPP equals P, which is pretty cool. OK, so this is actually like a cool version of the, you know, the, the backup dream. OK, we said, all right, we'll make one assumption that looks kind of innocuous. And then you start deriving like, lots of cool consequences that don't obviously have to do with the assumption. OK. Let me move on to talking about two. Okay. This is kind of related to this topic of approximation algorithms or being satisfied with you know, finding approximately good solutions rather than perhaps 100% you know, good solutions. And what's cool about two is that this is a, a regime where the dream is partly realized. Okay, so in fact, we know that this is impossible. This literal thing is impossible, just uh, assuming p does not equal np, and that's pretty cool. Like p does not equal np, it tells you that there's no polynomial time algorithm where if you give um, the algorithm a satisfiable 3CNF, it spits out an assignment satisfying 100% of the clauses. And somehow we actually upgraded that, like just still only assuming np does not equal np, to show that you can't even find an algorithm that spits out assignments that satisfy 90% of the clauses. So that's pretty good. It's like a case where we like took p does not equal np and kind of like boosted it, like without assuming anything extra. Now that result actually is very hard. So let me tell you a little bit about that kind of result. So in around 90. 93, 94, I'll say around 93, uh, they proved something called the PCP theorem. And the PCP theorem is not uh, stated in this language usually. It's usually stated in a language involving interactive proofs. But it's actually equivalent to the following. Uh, if you assume p does not equal np, then it implies there is no polynomial time algorithm such that uh, when you give it a satisfiable 3CNF, phi, a phi outputs an assignment satisfying at least 99.999999 uh, or so percent of clauses. Actually, when they proved this theorem in 93, they didn't even like count how many like nines you need to put here, but it was rumored to be about this many. Um, but the, the point is that somehow this is a number that's like strictly less than one. So like, in other words, there's no, there's no algorithm that can like get you uh, s assignments that are like as close as possible, kind of arbitrarily close to satisfying all the clauses. Uh, okay, so that's pretty cool. And then they were, you know, were like, let's make this better. So that was worked on for a while. And in like 1999, a very cool guy called uh, Johan Hostad he got this number down to uh, 7 eighths plus epsilon for any epsilon. Okay, so what is 7 eighths? 0.875. So it's, uh, you can write the same thing with like 0.87. Let's say Okay, so he showed that there's no algorithm that can always find assignments that satisfy at least seven eighths plus epsilon of the clauses. And uh, this is actually a particularly cool result. The seven eighths is not some like random number. This is kind of like an optimal hardness result. And uh, why is that? It's because, this is optimal because there actually exists a, an efficient polytime algorithm that uh, A, uh, such that 
A, when given a 3 Sienna formula, phi is always outputs an assignment satisfying at least 7 eighths of the clauses. So 7 eighths M clauses. So you can't always get 7 eighths of the clauses. And Hostad says it's NP hard to do even a tiny bit better than that. And that's kind of really cool. It sort of really refines the, the statement that 3SAT is NP-hard. I'll, I'll tell you about this algorithm now because it'll be important later. And actually, let me remark that I didn't even say that phi had to itself be satisfiable here. This algorithm A, you give it any 3 sienna formula, it'll find you an assignment that satisfies at least 7 eighths of the clauses. And that actually already proves like an interesting fact that for every 3SCF formula, there is an assignment that satisfies at least 7 eighths of the clauses. In fact, you can efficiently find one. Yep? Are the clauses or in expectation? Uh, we'll get there. But um, there is a deterministic algorithm that always finds one that satisfies at least 7 eighths of the clauses. <laughs> and. Um, this result, you know, it's kind of of the form, uh, it's an NP hardness result. I mean, it says, uh, assuming P does not equal NP, this, you know, finding these better than 7 eighths uh, satisfying assignments is NP hard. And it's really like a super, super long NP completeness result. Like, it shows that if you had some algorithm that could always beat 7 eighths, then you could actually have it convert it, they like use it as a subroutine to convert to an algorithm that always found perfectly satisfying assignments when they exist. But like it's much longer than the kinds that you're used to. Like if you put these two results together, it's probably like you know 100 pages, and like maybe it'd take like one graduate course to like um, like you know prove all of these two results. Um, so yeah, it's like uh, it's sophisticated, but like it was really good in the sense that they, you know, these people like they worked really hard. They were like, I'm just gonna assume P does not equal NP. I'm going to prove something cool. So in fact, yeah, let me uh, tell you, because it'll be interesting later, where this algorithm is coming from. Any, any questions, though, first? No? OK. Well, um, this is a pretty easy algorithm, but I'm going to tell you uh, not quite the full algorithm. I'll tell you something that's uh, close enough. I'll show that there exists there exists an efficient uh, randomized algorithm uh, such that the expected number of uh, clauses satisfied uh, by the assignment that A outputs when run on phi is at least 7 eighths M. Actually, it's equal. Okay. So this says that if you're willing to let your algorithm be randomized, and you're willing to say, well, you don't always have to get at least 7 eighths of the clauses. It's enough if you get me an assignment that, on average, gets 7 eighths of the clauses. Okay, if you're willing to solve, accept those two things, then you'll be satisfied by the proof I show you of this. But actually, it's honestly not hard to like convert it to a deterministic algorithm that has the property that it always gets at least this. But I won't bother to show that to you. This will be enough for us. And uh, yeah, how does this go? Well, it follows immediately from this lemma. The algorithm is literally just pick a random assignment the end. So uh, here's how it goes. Let phi of x be a 3CNF. And let, let's say a be a uniformly random assignment to the variables. Then the expected number of clauses satisfied by A 
is literally exactly 7 eighths m. Let me say by assigning x equals a. OK, so you probably or possibly saw like this or something like this in 251, but I'll prove it to you anyway. This uses the method of like indicator random variables and linearity of expectation. So um, let's introduce some indicator random variables. Let i, so j, be a random variable, which is 1 if a satisfies the jth clause of phi and 0 out otherwise. Okay, and here j is going from 1 to m, where m is the number of clauses in the formula. So uh, this is like you count one every time for each clause that's satisfied. So therefore, let me just call this whole expression, which itself is a random variable, number. So therefore, number is just i1 plus i2 plus dot, 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 plus i uh, m. Okay, so therefore the expected value of number, the expected number of satisfied clauses is, well, it's the expected value of this sum, but that's just uh, the expected value of all the individual variables added up. Okay, that's linearity of expectation. And the expected value of an indicator is just uh, the probability that it's the event that it's indicating is true. So this is the sum as i goes from 1 to n of the probability that um, the ith clause is satisfied by the random assignment a. OK, and now if we just like imagine an example, let's imagine that the ith clause is, I don't know, x1 or x5 or x9 bar, probability that this is satisfied by the random assignment A is, well, you may guess, it's 7 eighths. Because uh, the only way this is not satisfied is if A1 is 0, and A5 is 0, and A9 is 1. Okay. And A is just like a random bit string. So the probability that its first bit is 1, 0, 5th is 0, ninth is 1 is uh, 1 eighth. Okay, so the probability that it's not satisfied is 1 eighth. So the probability that it is satisfied is 7 eighths. Okay, so each clause has a 7 eighths chance of being satisfied by the random assignment. So this whole thing adds up to 7 eighths m. So on average, you satisfy seven eighths of the constraints when you pick a, uh, an assignment at random. Yep? So that you don't have variables. Oh, yeah, that's true. Excellent point. So everything should actually be about E3 sat. Thank you. That's, that's actually a very important point, which I forgot. So an E3 sat, if remember, E3 sat is where like every clause has exactly three distinct uh, literals. Um, actually, that's a funny point. Um, so actually, let me turn back to this, this um, state, these statements. So actually, uh, let me ignore that point for a second, although I'll mention something like amusing about it later. So uh, this is actually kind of amazing, right? Because we just saw that like, like the dumbest possible algorithm in the world, just choose a random assignment. Uh, gets you 7 eighths times m of the clauses in expectation. You can get it always. And then like Hostad's cool result says there's like no polynomial time algorithm that has a better guarantee than that. So like if you're, you know, you're talking about the worst case overall uh, phi's, you may as well just use the dumbest possible algorithm. It's kind of amazing. Um, yeah, so on this point, uh, Hostad's result is true even if the in the special case where it's E3 sat, where like all of the clauses have exactly three uh, literals, 
And that's the better result because it says even this special case is hard. Um, on the other hand, you would like to get you know, uh, the dumb algorithm to work uh, even in the non-special case where you're allowed to have clauses of size 1 and 2. And it's known that there's an efficient algorithm that has this guarantee in the general three-side case. And it's super, super, super hard. <laughs> it's incredibly hard uh, to prove. And in fact, like, when it's proved in like the late, no, it's, I don't know, sometimes in the 2000s, like it used like computer analysis, like a computer assisted proof. And like, it was like kind of mind boggling how challenging it was. Um, but it's true. So <laughs> like somehow there's like a big difference between, uh, you know, E3sat and 3sat here. Um, and it's weird because like it seems like your life is easier like when there are clauses of size one and two like that that seems what it seems like but when you pick the uh, an assignment randomly right the length two clauses are only satisfied with probably three quarters and the length ones with probably a half so this doesn't work but something else does work okay so I said here that the dream is uh, partly realized um, but not totally realized. So, um, you know, when Hulst had proved that, and once they proved the PCP theorem, they got like really uh, excited and they started proving what is called hardness of approximation results for lots of other problems. So, like, not only is solving the problem exactly NP hard, but even solving it approximately to some amounts is also NP hard. And they got really good at it and they developed like some super sophisticated techniques and it got to be a real industry. I guess much as probably like in like the early 1970s, just proving things NP-complete was like an industry. Uh, and they eventually got tired of. Um, but um, they weren't able to like crack all the cases that they wanted to. So let me give you an example of a case where um, we don't really know how to fulfill the, the full dream. So this is where the dream was, to illustrate that the dream was fulfilled only partly. Here's a very basic and interesting problem. It's an algorithm called, problem called min bisection. Okay, it's a simple problem. You're given an undirected graph G. You want to find a subset of the vertices of size exactly half. Okay, so assume n is even. Uh, so as to minimize the number of edges between S and its complement. Okay, so you're trying to you have a graph, and you're trying to cut it like perfectly in half in terms of vertices so that there's few edges coming across here as you can manage. Okay, it seems like a very basic problem. Okay, so here's what we know. Uh, in the 70s, they proved that finding the exact minimum bisection is NP hard. Okay, no surprise, these problems are usually NP hard. Okay, as of 2017, um, you know, so people then tried to find approximation algorithms, meaning algorithms that maybe are guaranteed to find a bisection where the number of edges crossing is at most two times the minimum. That would be nice. We don't know how to do that, though. We don't know any algorithm. That is guaranteed to achieve something like, at most, 10 times the minimum. That might not even be that great to you. It's like, well, here's an algorithm. I guarantee you it gets a bisection that has the number of edges crossing the, the partition that's at most 10 times what the best can achieve. Well, we can't even get that. We can't even get 100, or 1,000, or any constant factor. So basically, uh, kind of stink for algorithms approximation algorithm for this problem. So you might say, aha, this is where like, the complexity theorists should come in and show some negative results. Well, we kind of stink at that too. So if we just assume only p does not equal np, which is what we like to do, um, you know, we can't rule out, we don't know how to show, you know, a polytime algorithm Let me just write it like this, getting factor 1.0000001. 
Okay, so even if I tell you P does not equal NP, as far as we know, there's a polynomial time algorithm that actually finds a bisection of the vertices, such as the number of edges crossing the cut is at most, you know, 0.001% bigger than the, the minimum possible. Okay, and this is really uh, sad. We're really sad about this fact that, I mean, the best factor you can achieve in polynomial time is like somewhere between like barely bigger than one and, you know, infinity. I should mention that they do know how to get uh, log squared n here. So if you're willing to get a non-constant factor, you can do it. Uh, and that's a general situation, actually, in terms of approximation algorithms returning to this. So, I mean, it's a real zoo where, like, some problems, like uh, Mac, the E3 sat problem, we have the optimal hardness and uh, results, matching hardness and easiness results. And some problems we have, like, some kind of reasonable hardness result, assuming P does not equal NP, and some pretty good algorithm results. They don't necessarily match. Some problems, like, they don't even come close to matching. So it's a pretty wide open area. Yep? It might be a silly question, but why don't approximation algorithms sort of carry over in reduction? So isn't there, like, a one-to-one -one mapping between a lot of these NP questions? Oh, yeah, that's a terrific question, actually. So the question was, like, why don't approximation algorithms carry over between NP complete problems? So, like, we know that, like, 3SAT, um, you know, it has this exact, you know, 80, whatever, 7 eighths hardness of approximation. And we know there are polynomial time reductions between, like, 3 sad and min bisection because, you know, it's an NP-hard problem. So, like, you, um, in particular, if you have an instance of the min bisection problem, you have a graph. And let's say you want to know, you should really phrase it maybe like K min bisection. So, like, you're given a graph G and a number K, and you want to know, is there a bisection that has at most K edges going between the two parts? That's NP hard, so you might say, so there's a reduction from that to 3 set. And the reduction has the property that the answer to the I min bisection question is yes, if and only if the answer to the satisfiability question is yes. But these reductions, if you look at them, they sort of don't really preserve approximation quality. So they only sort of preserve exact satisfiability or like perfectly minimum bisection versus you know, not minimum bisection and uh, unset. So it'll probably be the case that, um, like it won't be the case that like if you take the SAT formula and you find an assignment that's like, you know, satisfies 99% of the clauses, then you can somehow translate that back into a bisection that's like only 1% worse than the minimum bisection. But somehow, you know, they use these like gadgets and like these gadgets, you know, you convert the graph to like a three set formula and the three set formula will have, I don't know, like you'll put in like a bunch of clauses that somehow represent variables and like you'll put in like a lot of like kind of junk stuff to like just make things work out that doesn't exactly capture the problem. You know, it'll just be like really easy to satisfy like a lot of the junk stuff and like it won't, typically it won't, there won't be sort of like a one to one mapping between how well you solve the how well the SAT formula is satisfied and like how small the bisection is. Um, but sometimes you can, if you like do a reduction that's kind of efficient in that way, you can translate like a hardness result for one problem to a hardness result for another problem. That's how they get some hardness results like that. Yeah. Another question? Okay. Uh, all right. Let me move on to Three. We talked about this for a while. Okay, so what's going on with three? Let's uh, cast our minds back here. So we're imagining perhaps you could find a um, polynomial time algorithm for SAT or three SAT or whatever that somehow you feel works most of the time for most instances. Of course, you have to, have to try to understand what most means. So, for example, people, you know, research who work on SAT solvers, they just build like algorithms that um, try to solve SAT, and if you set them to have like a polynomial timeout, then they'll just try to solve SAT in a polynomial amount of time, and they'll, they actually always give the correct answer, it's just sometimes they might like time out, and then you can treat that as them giving the wrong answer. And then they just say like, well, they seem to work pretty good on like all the assignments or instances that I try them on. Um, okay, so maybe that's not the most scientific statement. Um, so there's, you know, um, 
you know, research uh, called average case analysis, which tries to understand you know, questions like this from a more uh, rigorous point of view. Could you have algorithms that solve SAT um, with high probability when there's like a probability distribution on instances, for example? So actually, let me kind of draw you a picture about uh, the difference between worst case analysis and what's called average case analysis here. So this picture is, um, it's going to be slightly cartoonish. Like you might, if you ask me exactly what I mean by this picture, I might have to say like, well, I'm kind of cheating you a little bit. But so try to get a point across. So, um, oh, let me just mention that. OK, I'll stop talking about it, but um, this is an area where like, the dream is unrealized. Like, we don't know how to, just assuming p does not equal np, prove anything about like, the hardness of, satisfying, of, of uh, solving sat on most instances. So it's an area where like, if you want to prove statements like this, you're going to maybe need a new assumption. OK, let's get back to it. OK, so let me start by drawing a picture that kind of illustrates worst case hardness. So worst case hardness refers to statements like p does not equal np. OK, so and uh, you know, there's no algorithm that gets the right answer on every 3CNF formula. And I kind of like to draw the picture like this. So like imagine uh, somebody comes up with a polynomial time SAT solver, or putative SAT solver, it's a polynomial time algorithm. And it takes as input like a phi, and it outputs you know, its, its belief as to whether it's satisfiable or unsatisfiable. And I'm going to imagine like, testing it on like, a generator. And a generator is like some algorithm. It's also hopefully polynomial time, but let me just write this. A generator is like, uh, like a program that's like trying to generate hard instances. Okay? And what does that mean? Well, maybe you could just imagine that you plug into it a number n, and it outputs uh, an n variable formula phi, which is maybe like a hard, hard instance, one where it's going to be tricky to solve that on it. And uh, p does not equal np, or worst case hardness, it's kind of like saying this. That's why it's a bit of like a cartoon. For all potential solvers, there exists like generators that pool them. Okay, there exists generators such that, like, uh, if you run the solver on an instance produced by the generator, it'll get the wrong answer or fails. You know, maybe for all sufficiently large n or something. It's kind of like saying, you fix your favorite you know, polynomial time set solving algorithm. Well, p does not equal np implies that there exist ways to generate instances, larger and larger ones, where your algorithm fails. Um, the notion of average case hardness is kind of like the reverse. It's asking, could we have this? Uh, there exists a generator. And here I really would uh, prefer it to be polynomial time if you could help it. Um, such that, you know, that outputs phi's when you give it an n. Such that for all solvers, polynomial time solvers for sure, take in a phi and give out the sad or unsad answer. Um, same statement, you know, solver when run on what the generator outputs fails. So average case analysis, uh, average case hardness is asking about the possibility of this. Could there be like one fixed, like hard instance generator which can fool any polynomial time algorithm? And um, Depending on what the assumptions are behind this picture, this may seem impossible. And 
And the reason is, like, you know, this generator is just outputting, I mean, it's outputting like one set formula for each input or, uh, you know, variable size n. So your solver can just be like exactly tuned to this generator to like, it can just have the answers like built in. Like it doesn't really have to solve it, right? Maybe for this you need to, instead of let the solver be a polynomial time algorithm, it should be maybe a polynomial time circuit family so that it can like do, it could just have like the correct answer hard coded in for each different input length. But basically this is not a, a good, this is not really a possible situation as it stands. You know, the solver can just be tuned to the generator and have the answers built in. That's true if you assume that the generator is a deterministic algorithm. So to make this, you know, not impossible, well, I don't want to say not impossible, but maybe not, Im not impossible, um, in this picture we always allow or, you know, want this generation algorithm to be randomized. Okay? So you can imagine that in addition to like n, like it also gets, you know, random coins, international symbol for random coin flips. Um, and therefore, uh, this is good in the sense that now the generator has the, you know, for a given input length n, has the potential, potentiality, the potential to output exponentially many different hard, potentially hard 3CNF instances. And so the solver cannot just like have all the answers hard coded in. Okay, now we have to, if we want to say that, uh, you know, it's hard to solve SAT on the average case, then we'll put in with high probability here. So this is kind of the situation we're thinking about, like, is it possible to have, like, some kind of random algorithm that generates potentially hard SAT instances, such that that one algorithm can fool all polynomial time SAT solvers. It can make all of them fail. And like the solver can even like know the code for the generator. And in fact, you know, this is like, this is like saying, this is a stronger way of saying that SAT is hard than this, right? This is just, for every algorithm there's like some instance where it fails. But this is like saying like there's a, a way to generate like hard instances where like every algorithm fails. And in fact, although this is harder, this is actually much more desirable in life. We really wish this were the case, because this is exactly what you need for cryptography. Okay. So in cryptography, I mean, we're not going to get into it, but in cryptography, you need, basically, you need the ability to generate really hard puzzles, you know, like an RSA, like you pick two random primes and you multiply them together, and then you're like, try to factor this, right? Like, that's the generation algorithm, and then, like, these are all, like, you know, the people that are trying to break RSA, they're all trying to design polynomial time, like, factoring algorithms, and the hope is that, you know, we have this hardness that, like, you know, there, is, it, there isn't a polynomial time algorithm that can crack this one particular way of generating, like, hard random puzzles or problems. It's, that's why it's particularly good if this algorithm is polynomial time. So, like, not only is there some way of generating hard instances, but, like, actually there's an efficient way to generate them. Because then, you know, you need that if you're going to base cryptography on it. You need the process of setting up your you know, keys or whatever to be itself efficient. Any questions? Okay, so this is, uh, we're, you know, we're wondering whether this situation is true for 3SAT, let's say. Like, there is some way to generate hard instances that seem to fool every solver. We don't know how to prove a statement like that, even if you assume hardness in the worst case. But, um, you know, we can try. So let's try, like, exactly in the context of 3SAT. How can we generate hard, well, potentially hard to solve 3CNF formulas at random? That's the question we're asking ourselves. And a pretty good idea is to just do the literally the most naive possible thing, which is just pick uniformly random instances. So let me talk about uniformly random I'm going to call them 3SAT instances. It probably should be called 3CNF instances. But let me just say random 3SAT instances. And I'm going to define this. So you can really think about I'm defining a particular generating algorithm or a family of them. 
So this is the definition. What is the uniformly random 3SAT instance? Well, uh, it has some parameters. n is the number of variables. You can kind of think of that as like the in input, OK? It's like you say, OK, I want a 1,000 variable 3SAT instance. Now, there's going to be a parameter. And this is a key parameter. I'll draw it slightly bigger than normal, called delta. And this is known as the clause density. And uh, it's a parameter. And it's really just the, you know, the number such that m, the number of clauses, is delta n. OK, so like maybe your clause density delta will be 10. And all that means is you're going to have 10 times n clauses. OK? So you know, delta is kind of a parameter of the generator. n is like the input to the generator. And uh, it's going to output an n variable delta n clause 3 CNF. And how will it do that? It'll just pick all the delta n clauses totally uniformly at random. Okay, so what it does is it outputs phi, which is a 3 CNF, where you choose m equals delta n uh, random clauses independently. And what is a random clause? It's literally just you know, uniformly chosen from the, how many possibilities are there for a clause? I guess these are even going to be E3 side instances, if you like. So there's n, choose three uh, possibilities for the variables. And then you may or may not negate each one of them, so maybe times 2 to the 3. Okay, so you literally write down a, a 3 CNF formula in the most naive way, random way. OK, so now let's imagine like this is our choice. And now we have to ask ourselves, well, do we think there's a polynomial time algorithm that, you know, given an output of this generator, correctly answers, let's say, with 99% uh, chance, uh, whether it's satisfiable or unsatisfiable? Before we try to answer that question, or even try to think about that question, it's a good idea to think about like an even more basic question, question zero, which is, well, forget algorithms for a second. What is the answer going to be? In other words, is phi likely to be satisfiable or unsatisfiable? And uh, the answer is it depends. It depends on delta. It depends very heavily on delta. OK, so why is that? Well, let's first imagine that delta is small. Actually, I'm going to draw a little plot here. This is like the delta axis. And this is actually going to be the probability that phi is satisfiable axis. You see, if delta is small, there's very, very, I mean, it's very small, then there's very few constraints. There's very few clauses. And that means it's more likely to be satisfiable. I mean, if you just have a small number of constraints, you have more you know, possibilities for it to be satisfiable. So this is the more likely <coughs> satisfiable regime. And conversely, if delta is really, really large, it's like you're adding more and more clauses, more and more constraints to how the variables have to be assigned, so it makes it more likely to be unsatisfiable. That should make sense. Now, let me tell you some facts. Uh, the first fact is an extremely easy fact, easy enough that I would classify it as an exercise if you want to try it. 
If uh, delta is bigger than about 5.2, then when you choose phi at random, phi is exponentially unlikely to be satisfiable. I mean, the probability of it being uh, unsatisfiable is like 1 minus, you know, I don't know, uh, I don't know, 1.1 1, 1 .1 to the minus n or something. Like, it's exponentially small that it'll be satisfiable. In the exercise, if you want to try to prove that, you use the union bound. Uh, but we won't need to get into that. So that means at some point, I don't know where 5.2 might be here. The probability of it being satisfiable is like basically zero. Okay. So if you know if you set delta to be six and you do this generator, you can be kind of sure the answer is going to be unsat. On the other hand, this is a it's not a very hard theorem, but if I wanted to prove it to you, it'd probably take one lecture, which is a lot, so we're not gonna do it. But if uh, delta is less than or equal to 0.16 or something, then phi is exponentially likely to be un like exponentially likely to be satisfiable. So I guess exponentially unlikely to be unsat. Okay, so it's extraordinarily likely to be satisfiable. So let me put one up here. So it looks like this. By the way, I should mention that this uh, number is this is log base uh, seven eighths of a half. You can see that seven eighths is coming up again. Okay. Um, so it's actually at some point it's gonna there's some gonna be some transition or it's gonna somehow transition to being more likely to be unsat versus sat, and. Um, Here's you know, an unproven, decade-studied, um, uh, physics-inspired conjecture. Unbelievably, this has something to do with physics, too. But um, it's basically that there's a phase transition at some critical value of delta, which is about 4.2667. It's not really going to be that important in this class, but okay, here's 4.267 or whatever. And it says that this is not, it's basically known to be true, although we don't know how to prove it, that the plot looks like this. Okay, so like if you pick a random uh, three CNF formula in this way where delta is 4.26, then it's almost surely going to be satisfiable. And if you set delta to be 4.27, it's almost surely going to be unsatisfiable. And uh, it didn't have to be like that, by the way. Like, if you ask all the same questions for two sat, then the plot, like, you know, it, it looks like this. It looks like normal kind of plot. Okay, I tell you that for uh, interest's sake. Um, actually, let me add one more uh, fact about what happens with this generator. And this fact is also not very hard. If you know the Chernoff bound, it's an exercise. So maybe that depends on whether or not you took 359. Uh, we won't prove it, but it's not hard. So if uh, delta is big enough, let's say, I didn't actually check the numbers, but let's say 10-ish, then with high probability, well, we already know that with high probability, phi is unsatisfiable. But it's actually better than that. It's not just unsatisfiable. Uh, every assignment A not only fails to satisfy it, but satisfies at most uh, 7 eighths plus some epsilon a uh, fraction of constraints. 
So you might say like it's very unsatisfiable. And this is like as strong as you can imagine because we know every single formula at all, there's always an assignment that gets at least seven eighths of the constraints. And this says when you pick a random one, as long as delta is big enough, maybe bigger than 10, um, there's no assignment that basically does better than that. And uh, if you want to do that exercise, the hint is to uh, like reverse this lemma. In this lemma, we said, OK, you have some fixed phi. And then imagine picking a random assignment A. Then on average, you know, it'll satisfy 7 eighths of the clauses. If you're going to do this exercise, it's the reverse. You first fix an assignment A. Then you imagine that phi is chosen at random, according to this method. And you ask, what is the expected number of clauses that A satisfies in phi? It will also be 7 eighths m by basically the same argument. And that kind of says that for every single assignment, it's going to satisfy around 7 eighths of the clauses in your random phi. Now what you need is that that is true for every one of the 2 to the n assignments. You know, if you're willing to like tolerate a little slack, OK, this is where a churn off bound and a union bound comes in. But it's true. OK, so um, I want to get to this picture or this question. OK, for this distribution on phi's, do we think a solver like this exists? But are there any questions at this point? OK. Um, good. So let's think about algorithmic hardness. You know, as I said, we're going to focus on hardness in this class. So let's see what we might think to ourselves if we, you know, temporarily conjecture it or imagine that there is no polynomial time algorithm which does a good job at solving satisfiable, satisfiability for these random 3CNF formulas. And actually here, you have to be a little bit careful about uh, the definitions, uh, which I won't. I'll be a little bit careful about them in a second, but um, uh, I won't be 100% careful. You see, you have to be a little bit careful about the definitions, because like the solver, let's say, gets to look at the code for the, the generating algorithm. So I mean, it knows what delta is. So it kind of like knows this fact. So you could just say, like, hey, Here's the algorithm. Like if delta is you know, 4, the solver algorithm just says it's satisfiable. And it's going to be right like pretty much all the time. Or if delta is 10, the, algorithm, the solving algorithm would just say it's unsatisfiable without doing anything. And it'll be right like pretty much all the time. Um, but we don't want that. Somehow that seems like cheating. So let me uh, talk about how you can set up the definition so you get like a legitimately interesting question. Okay, so algorithmic hardness is what we're interested in. So like, first let's imagine that we're talking about the case where delta is less than this magic number, whatever. Okay, so let's imagine the generator where you fix delta to be, I don't know, 4. Okay? So it is true that a solver can just not even look at the input, always say satisfiable, and then it's right, like almost always. But if, the solver, if a solver comes back to you and says, hey, I think the formula phi you gave me is satisfiable, you should, be really, you should really be like, OK, show me the satisfying assignment. Well, you know, I mean, it's the least it could do, right? Um, so in this regime, like, the natural algorithmic problem is like, the solver should actually find a satisfying assignment. And we know that with like, overwhelming probability, this is a fair task. There is a satisfying assignment. But actually, the question of actually finding one is not so easy. This proof that um, you know, it exists doesn't actually constructively give you an assignment. Okay? And so this is actually an interesting uh, task. And they have like SAT solving competitions about precisely this task every year or two. And uh, let me just tell you, to cut to the chase, what we know as of 2017. Um, we know. Uh, 
polytime algorithms that provably works when uh, delta is at most 3.52. See, this task gets easier the smaller delta is, because the smaller delta is, the less constrained the instance is, and the easier it is to find a satisfying assignment. Okay, so these are theorems. This is not from 2017. These theorems are from like 90s. Um, but the, like, the best thing we know along these lines is that there is an algorithm that um, when you give it a random 3CNF with delta less than 3.52, then with very high probability in polynomial time, it'll actually find a satisfying assignment. Uh, then the physics people, it's funny that it's physics people, uh, work a little bit more heuristically. And actually, in 2015, 16, they actually made some developments, and there are algorithms that uh, seem to work in polynomial time. It's unproven. For delta less than 4.266, they're not exactly sure. Mm. It's a little hard to analyze because it's kind of heuristic. Like they're actually doing experiments and stuff. So there's a bit of a debate as to whether they work all the way up to here or ra just almost all the way up to here. But in practice, they're pretty good. Uh, and you can like download these off the web and stuff and try them out. Uh, so in some sense, this doesn't look like a very hard problem, actually. Doesn't look, it's hard to say, but maybe you said delta like super close to the threshold or something. Doesn't, I mean, you wouldn't want to stake your life that like polynomial time algorithms can't do this task. Well, that was about delta less than the threshold, the critical value. What about bigger? Now again, you have to ask the question carefully. I mean, you can't just say like, oh, the solver always outputs unsatisfiable, and it's, it's, it's always, uh, almost always correct. Um, it's a little harder. Like, what should the uh, solver try to find when it's unsatisfiable? Well, actually, this is the right way to think about it. Uh, the solver should just try to output a proof that it's unsatisfiable. Certificate of unsatisfiability. And you might say, what do you mean by that? And actually, you'll have a good understanding in your head if you just imagine it should literally try to output like a mathematical proof, like on a piece of paper, like, check it out. This proves that the instance is unsatisfiable. But you know, formalizing that would be a little bit annoying. So here's another. Here's a rigorous definition of like an algorithmic task which captures exactly the, the thing we want to get at here, like um, efficient algorithms that are you know, trying to sort of solve SAT in this regime where like it's almost surely going to be unsat, but like we want them to really solve something as opposed to just say, oh yeah, it's probably unsatisfiable. So here is another definition. I'm going to call this a, a delta 3sat uh, refuter. So it somehow it tries to refute satisfiability. It is a polynomial time algorithm. Let me just build that into the definition so I don't have to say, like, talk about polynomial time refuters, uh, such that. has three properties. Given any 3CNF, it runs and then either outputs uh, unsat, which means it thinks that the formula is unsatisfiable, or it outputs no comment, which means that it has no comment. Next, it should never be wrong. Uh, 
this kind of corresponds in the satisfiability case to, you know, you're not allowed to just say, hey, it's going to be satisfiable. Like, by requiring you to output a satisfying assignment, it's kind of like making sure you're, like, never wrong. And what does never wrong mean here? It, it means that, like, it never says unset when phi is actually satisfiable. Okay. So far, achieving these two things is not hard. You just say no comment to everything. Okay, so we have to rule that out as well. And um, again, you know, it should be able to say unsat. If delta is bigger than whatever, 4.2667, it should be able to say unsat most of the time, right? Because it really will be unsatisfiable most of the time. So that's what we require. Give in, you know, a random phi with parameter delta. You, uh, you know, the probability that a of phi says unsat is, let's just say it's at least 99%. Just like with BPP and RP, it doesn't really matter what you put here, but we'll say 99%. Okay? So in some sense, like, when you, this is an algorithm where, like, if you give it phi, that's, you know, drawn in this regime where it's likely to be unsat, it's very, very likely to come back and say unsat, but not just that, this is something you've proved by your algorithm, like, if it does come back and say unsat, then it's really definitely 100% unsatisfiable. Like 1% of the time, it might come back and say, like, I don't know, no comment. In which case, probably it actually is still unsatisfiable, but the algorithm wasn't able to, like, convince itself of that. Um, or it could be that, like, by, like, a crazy fluke, you actually hit one of the satisfiable um, instances arising when delta is bigger than the, pr the critical value. Okay, so this is a subtle definition. But it's the thing you would kind of like to have algorithmically. Okay, this, is a, this would be like, if you had such a thing, that would be like a positive result. Sort of saying that, you know, for delta bigger than 4.2, whatever, you know, there is a, an algorithm that does a good job. Any question about this? Yeah. Yeah, you can think about it this way. See, these are things that you, the mathematician, like proved on the side about your algorithm. And then like that proof that you wrote down on a piece of paper, plus like in some sense the transcript of the algorithm running and outputting unsat, those two things together sort of constitute a mathematical proof that phi is unsatisfiable. So you can think about it that way. Um, yeah, in practice, it's, um, in practice, like, basically one of two things happens. Like, either these algorithms, they uh, find, like, maybe a, a, a constant size collection of clauses, which they themselves, like, cannot simultaneously be satisfied. And they basically just output that, and they're like, check it out, there's no way to solve, satisfy these, you know, 36 clauses, just these 36 clauses. Something like that. Or, um, well, they'll use something like linear programming. I don't know if you guys have studied that. Um, so they'll form like maybe a linear programming relaxation of the three satisfiability problem. And then they'll show that even this linear program, which is like a, whose value is like an upper bound on the satisfiability, if even that is not satisfiable and that can be checked in polynomial time, then the original problem, the three set problem is not satisfiable. But we won't get into that. Uh, okay, so let me tell you the facts that are known, like, analogous to these facts. Saying that, well, if delta is like this, we can do it. If delta is like that, we can't do it. Um, okay, and of course, this, this problem also gets easier the bigger delta is. This is like, as delta gets bigger, like, it's not only unsatisfiable, but, like, it's becoming unsatisfiable for, like, simpler and simpler reasons. There's, like, more and more constraints, so the refuter has, like, a better chance to work. Okay, so here's what we know as of 2017. Uh, do these uh, delta 3sat refuters exist? For, 
let's say delta equals 5. We don't know. Delta equals 10. We don't know. Delta equals 50. We don't know. Delta equals 1,000. We don't know. Yeah, any constant C, we don't know. Uh, actually, if delta equals uh, square root n, so that's like m equals n to the 1.5, then the answer is yes. And that's proved also in the early 90s-ish, something like that. And uh, that proof uses some very heavy uh, linear algebra. So another great reason to love linear algebra. Um, but that's the best thing that we know. So unlike the, the satisfiability regime, in here, seems like we actually really have a hard problem, like a hard computational task of the flavor of solving SAT on random instances. So it's kind of like, maybe this is a good, I mean, maybe we achieved this. Now, it's just an empirical fact, I mean, in the sense that, like, we don't know how to prove these, uh, any, the existence of these refuters. But it's even better, I mean, in the sense that, like, you know, here we had some, like, heuristic situation. We don't have anything like that uh, over here. So, like, we don't even have, like, a candidate algorithm that we kind of think works, but we cannot prove it. Like, we have no clue. So they also, like, some years had, like, a SAT-solving competition for this problem, and they canceled it because, like, nobody submitted any good entries. Um, so based on that, you might maybe make a hypothesis. And that was done by uh, Feige in O2. It's called Feige's hypothesis. Well, he didn't call it that, but we've come to call it that. And it's just this. Uh, for all constant delta, no matter how large, delta three sad refuters don't exist. Okay. And let me just close by saying that, like, just like in the, the backup dream from so long ago, like, it's panned out with this hypothesis. So this is like one hypothesis that, you know, says SAT is in some sense hard on the average. But this one fixed hypothesis can be used by reductions to prove a lot of things. So first of all, it implies that P does not equal NP. If there were a SAT solving algorithm, like a perfect one, then of course you, these refuters would exist. So this is stronger than P does not equal NP. But it proves some more things. For example, it proves easily, like this, I could also call an exercise for you. I was going to do it if I had time, but I don't. Uh, it implies Hostad's result. OK, in like, in like six minutes. OK, remember Hostad's result was this like 100 page theorem that like would take a course to prove um, that says, there's no polynomial time algorithm, which, given any satisfiable three side instance, finds an assignment satisfying even seven eighths of the clauses. More than seven eighths of the clauses. Uh, it's easy to show that if there were such an algorithm, you could turn it into a refuter. As long as delta is bigger than 10, and it just sort of follows immediately from a little bit of thought and uh, this fact, which no longer appears, that once 10 is, delta is bigger than about 10, in a random 3CNF instance, it's, uh, the best assignment will almost surely satisfy barely more than 7 eighths of the clauses. And finally, the last thing I'll say is, so that's, I mean, in some sense, like, well, we took a stronger hypothesis, so that was cheating, but I mean, this is much easier to prove. And that's good, because we're stuck on proving a lot of similar things. So for example, Feige in his original paper showed that if you assume this hypothesis, it shows that there's, um, no polynomial time approximation algorithm for min bisection, remember this problem, achieving factor uh, four thirds. Which is not so amazing because it's not like we even know an algorithm that achieves four thirds or even four thousand thirds, but 
We also didn't know any hardness result at all. And now, you know, he shows that there's no algorithm that guarantees to find a bisection, which is at most 33% worse than the optimum. So hey, man, that's pretty, that's better than nothing. And similarly, people have recently been using this to show like other hardness of approximation results that we don't know how to prove using just p does not equal np and this like host dot technology. OK, so if you have a problem you want to show it's hard, you know, consider like starting from this assumption. OK, uh, see you on Tuesday. We'll talk about consequences of exponential time hypothesis.